Last week, we trauma bonded as a group over Colleen Hoover's most popular books. But what you may not have noticed is that there was one huge monstrosity missing from that video. And what I withheld from you was a little book called Verity. And Verity is deserving of its own video simply because it is the only Colleen Hoover book that exists that is a horror novel. And I know some of you guys are gonna be like, okay, okay relax, it's a thriller. It's a thriller. I don't care. This is the closest thing to a horror book that exists in the Whovian metaverse. And like I and so many of you guys who watch these videos have said she should be writing horror novels because many of her protagonists in her books are straight up villains. Oh. Ben from November 9th might as well be Freddy <gasps> Krueger. And don't get me started on Miles from Ugly Love. That's Pinhead Larry. But my point is this genre should be her bread and butter. This thing should be more buttery than the brown butter pasta at the spaghetti factory. Spaghetti heads, you know what I'm talking about. But sadly, the end result of Verity is like if you forced Stephen King's Misery and Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl to have a baby, and then you use that baby as a bowling ball, and then the bowling ball baby went straight into the gutter. And while this book is deranged and stupid, is this a safe spot? Space to say that this has kind of a B-movie charm to it at times. Like this feels like a Blumhouse movie from 2015 that has 10% on Rotten Tomatoes. But let's just get into it. The book opens with our main character, Lowen, getting splattered with blood because a pedestrian right in front of her just got hit by a dump truck and she has zero reaction to this. She doesn't look up to see if the guy is dead. She just says that she already knows he is from the pop sound that it made. Not only that, she says that nobody else around her reacts to this either. Nobody screams, which is a little bit bewildering to say the least. You're telling me at least some people wouldn't involuntarily scream or Rowan, sorry, Lowen, wouldn't instantaneously look up without her thinking about it. I mean, there's blood on her shirt and her face from this. And if you're wondering if this ever comes up in the book ever again? The answer is no. This is something that just happens in the book and is never mentioned again. Not even in her inner monologue. Like, she acts like this shit just like happens to her every day. She goes to a nearby coffee shop to use a bathroom and wash the blood off of her. And it's there that she meets a guy named Jeremy. And he guides her to the bathroom and gives her wet paper towels so she can clean herself. And you're probably thinking, wow, what a nice guy. Have we finally gotten that sweet, sweet protagonist that we've wanted this whole time? Not really, because right off the bat, he does something pretty creepy. He locks himself in the bathroom with Lowen when she takes her shirt off. When she's wiping the blood off of her, like, chest and she's just in her bra, he doesn't even, like, look away, he just stares at her in her bra. And for some reason, Lowen thinks this is, like, super chivalrous. Sorry, I can't say that word. Ah! Chivalrous? Chival? Shival? Shabbat Shalom? He does end up giving her his shirt after this, but I just think the whole idea of locking yourself in a bathroom with a complete stranger and then staring at them in their undies is enough to give anybody the heebie-jeebies. I think we need to bring back the words heebie and jeebie, because clearly that's the only way to describe this scenario. But before we continue with Verity, I want to talk to you about something even spookier. Spam calls. Da -da -da. Duh. If you're anything like me, I was receiving so many spam calls that I just stopped answering my phone entirely. I said, y'all do not call me because I'm scared. <laughs> but this week's sponsor, Aura, identifies data brokers who expose your information and they submit opt out requests on your behalf. So you don't have to deal with trying to free yourself from all these annoying robocalls and spam emails on your own. Because let me tell you, Trying to do that is such a pain. Data brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard. And the reason why is because they're making a fortune off of selling your information, including details such as where you live. Hello, creepo alert. No one wants strangers online knowing things like that. So it's truly amazing how Aura steps in and helps, but that's not the only thing Aura does. 
is. They do so much to protect you and your family from online threats, including managing parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and it's all at one affordable price on one handy dandy app. Aura has definitely changed the way I navigate myself online. I've changed a bunch of my passwords. So I tell you what, you can either continue to let people exploit and profit off of your private information, or you can go to Aura.com slash Nikki Carrion to get a 14 day free trial and see if any of your passwords have been leaked and manage your other private information. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. Thank you Aura for sponsoring this video and now back Activity. Lowen is also thinking about how attractive this guy is, which I'm not sure if it would be possible to thirst over somebody when you're covered in blood and just kind of like witnessed by proxy this guy who got hit by a car. But Jeremy asks her if she's shocked and she says she's not sure. She asks him if he's okay because he also apparently witnessed this and he says that he's not shocked because he's seen worse. Lowen is shook by this cryptic ass reply because you know what does that mean she's locked inside the bathroom with this guy and he seems worse than brains squeamched on the ground after a moment of awkwardness he reveals that he had to pull his eight-year-old daughter out of a lake five months ago which makes Lowen comfortable enough to share that her mother died last week from cancer Lowen thinks about asking him out to get coffee together but changes her mind when she sees that he's wearing a wedding ring. So they just stare at each other for a few moments and then part ways. Lowen makes her way down the street because she has a meeting with a publisher called Pantom Press, which I personally kept reading throughout the book as Panem Press. Hello, Hunger Games fans rise up. But anyway, she's hoping to get a book deal today because she's like flat broke. Like if she doesn't get work soon, she's absolutely screwed because she's already getting evicted out of her apartment. But when she enters this building, someone behind her says, nice shirt. And boom, what do you know? It's Jeremy again. She asks him what he's doing here, and he says that he has a meeting on the 14th floor, which is the same floor as her meeting. She asks him if he's a writer too, and he says, no, but my wife is. And when they get in this meeting with each other, she finds out that the publisher is offering her $225,000 to finish a book series by an author named Verity Crawford. And Verity Crawford is Jeremy's wife. And this seems like a gold mine because not only are they offering her all this money, Verity is a very, very popular author of thriller books. So I would assume completing her series would give her more ammunition to land different book deals now. Lowen is confused why Verity wouldn't just finish this series on her own. And it turns out the reason why she can't is because she drove into a tree a couple months ago and she has like brain damage. She's not even conscious, like she doesn't know what's going on at all. Jeremy tells her that they want her to write these books because she has experience in the genre and Verity was also a really big fan of her books. He also mentions that not only did one of his daughters die, like the one that he referenced having to pull out of the lake, but another one of his daughters died within the span of the last six months before Verity got in her accident. So his life is pretty shifty at the moment, Lowen's broke, and after him insisting again and again that she finish the series, she says yes. In the next chapter, we get some pretty useless information about Lowen having dated this dude named Amos in her early 20s and she goes on this mini tangent about how people in their early 20s shouldn't have fetishes. In your early 20s, vanilla sex should satisfy a person without the need to introduce fetishes so early on in the relationship. I like to think about Amos when I find myself disappointed with the current state of my life. As I stare at the pink eviction notice on the door, I remind myself that it could be worse. I could still be with Amos. This is 
something and a theme that never ever gets brought up in the book again. <laughs> I would honestly think this is something that would have got like weaned out in the editing process because it just has nothing to do with anything. Is this information crucial or is Colleen letting us know that she doesn't like fetishes? I'm always confused by what is her and what is actually the character. <laughs> Moving on, as I mentioned, Loen is getting evicted from her apartment and she has to wait several weeks for her check that's gonna come out of this book deal. So meanwhile, she's kind of screwed. She's already filled out an application for another apartment but the apartment isn't available for two weeks so this is why it becomes practical for her to move in with Jeremy in his house for at least two weeks while she studies Verity's notes in order to get an idea of how the rest of the series should end and Jeremy is more than willing to have her stay over in fact it's almost weird how bad he wants her to be there he's like hey come over to my house stay over here stranger I'm pretty sure it would have been more practical for him to just loan her money to stay in a hotel or an Airbnb while she takes these notes and studies them there. But alas, if anybody thought that practically, we would not have the shit storm that follows up with this. On her way to Jeremy's house, she listens to one of Verity's audiobooks, and this is when she realizes that all of her books are written from the villain's point of view. And not only that, but they're really, really good, so she's questioning whether or not she can even fulfill the last three books in the series. But when she arrives at Verity's house, she discovers that this thing is a mansion. I personally imagine it looking like the hotel from Hotel Transylvania, but feel free to envision it however you like. Anyway, she's pulling up and then she gets jump scared by this little boy outside her car door. And you just know that there would be like a vine boom horror movie noise. Like if this, if this was a movie, it would be like, oh. And it turns out that this is Verity and Jeremy's third child. His name is Crew. And he's little. He's like five, I think. I'm not sure. I'll put his age on the screen when I figure it out. But he just know that he's like little. He's a chibi. And you would think for that reason that Lowen would have like more sympathy for him. But instead, this is their first interaction. I open the door and he takes a step back as soon as I get out of the car. Hey, the child doesn't respond. Do you live here? Yes. Sorry, I don't know how to do a baby voice. Let me try that again. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, this is embarrassing. Um, I look at the house behind him, wondering what that must have been like for a child to grow up in such a home. Must be nice. I mutter. Used to be. He turns and begins walking up the driveway towards the front door. What is this? Must be nice. Dude, his like mom's in a coma. Two of his sisters died. You're jealous of like pretty much an orphan baby. Like what is wrong with you? So she goes into the home and Jeremy shows her her room, which is the master bedroom. And the first thing Lowen notices when she enters the room is that the headboard of the bed has like all these bite marks on it. And in her inner monologue, she says, I'm wondering which one of them had to bite the headboard in order to keep quiet during sex. Have I ever had sex that intense? And if this were me seeing this, well, first of all, the first thing that I'm going to think is why would you choose a headboard to clamp onto with your teeth during sex? Like that just sounds really uncomfortable. Like you're telling me you're on top of him and like he's like jerking around and your teeth are just like hanging on, breaking off, hanging onto a wooden headboard. Ma'am, ma'am, what is happening? Jeremy then takes her to Verity's office where there's stacks and stacks of books, boxes of manuscripts, just tons of things for Lowen to go through and try to piece together kind of what Verity wanted for the rest of the series. After this, Lowen meets Verity. I say meets in quotations because Verity is awake but not alert or conscious of anything that's going on. She just sees her in her hospital bed in her room. Apparently Verity can't even move her limbs so she has like a full-time nurse that comes every day to help her eat food, take her to the bathroom, wipe her, all of that stuff. Lowen returns to Verity's office and while she's digging through these boxes of 
old manuscripts, she finds one that's titled So Be It, which turns out to be an autobiography. And the first line of it is really intriguing. It says, I sometimes think back on the night I met Jeremy and wonder, had we not made eye contact, would my life still end the same? So she decides to continue reading this because A, she's nosy, B, her copium is that she should read this to get to know Verity better and then that will improve her writing of her books. The first chapter of So Be It recounts the story of how Verity met Jeremy and the night they met, she snuck into a charity event because she was looking for a rich investor to like do Sims woohoo with because she's pretty much a starving artist at this point like she's not famous for writing or anything yet and she sees Jeremy and she assumes that he's one of these rich investors in question and so she's standing alone at the bar when he comes up behind her puts his arm over her shoulder and is like make sure you only serve her water for the rest of the evening Verity says I'm perfectly capable of deciding when I've had enough to drink I've only had three drinks all evening Verity asks the bartender for another Moscow mule and Jeremy says no she'll only have water. Verity starts getting mad at him and he says you didn't even give me a chance to explain why I'd like you to have water. You've had three drinks in 45 minutes and if you keep going at that rate I won't feel comfortable asking you to leave with me. Very smooth or should I say Verity smooth. Assume a girl wants to fuck you. Don't waste time asking questions like, how are you? What's your name? That's beta male behavior. They leave the party together and they get into what Verity assumes is Jeremy's limo. And they start making out in their smooch smooch. But when Verity asks him where his driver is, he says, I don't know. And then when she asks him whose limo is this, he also says, I don't know. And it turns out that Jeremy is also broke and he's just an entry-level investor. Verity decides that she doesn't care about this because she already likes him and they continue smooching until the limo driver arrives and is like, hey, what the hell? And he chases them off Looney Tunes style until he finally leaves them alone and they get into his actual car, which is a Honda Civic. Once they're in the car, Jeremy decides that he wants to take her to Steak and Shake. And let me tell you, this whole scene that's about to happen has got to be like in the top five most goofy watch mojo fingerings that has ever been written. And yes, fingering as in... <laughs> Let me just read this verbatim. <clears throat> <clears throat> he fed me before he fucked me, took me to Steak and Shake, and we sat on the same side of the booth eating french fries and sipping chocolate shakes between kisses. The restaurant was mostly empty, so we were in a quiet corner booth far enough away that no one noticed when Jeremy's hand slid up my thigh and disappeared between my legs. No one heard me when I moaned. No one cared when he pulled his hand away and whispered that he wasn't going to give me an orgasm in a steak and shake. You're telling me he was eating fries and he took his greasy, salty hand, and he put it in your hoo-ha. To me, that's not even the worst part because maybe he forgot that his fingers were salty and greasy in the heat of the moment. I'm more concerned that the fact that you guys are A, doing this in public where these poor workers are gonna walk over and witness this whole thing. B, are you guys really drinking milkshakes before sex? Like what? You're, you're gonna have to do a diarrhea. Or do people just not have IBS anymore? Bring back shame, bring back bullying, bring back IBS. <laughs> but this chapter concludes with her saying, I needed to please him. I needed to be what made him smile, breathe, wake up in the mornings. And for a while I was, I was his sole reason for living until he discovered the one thing that meant more to him than I did, which is pretty rather ominous, I do declare. <laughs> but in the present, Lowen is not that concerned about it and she heads downstairs to eat dinner with Jeremy. And while they talk, she can't help but notice how attractive his hands are, the same hands that fingered Verity at the Steak and Shake, which by the way, I don't live near Steak and Shake is it good? It doesn't seem like a great place. 
to get fingered, but I've never been inside one. Maybe it's a beautiful galleria. Besides her thirsting over his burger hands though, they talk about how Jeremy misses his kids and how it's been difficult without Verity. And, and Lowen can kinda empathize, em empathize with him because her mother died after she was a caretaker for her for a very long time. They also stare into each other's eyes for an unnaturally long time because you can't ever just have like a good normal conversation without sexual tension, obviously. We can't do a heart to heart without getting horned up. Don't take me for a fool. I know how these books work at this point. It's just really funny to me. In the next chapter of So Be It, the autobiography, sorry, I'm just refreshing your memory because I have a fish brain and I'll literally just forget what anyone's talking about in like 30 seconds. So in this chapter, we learn more about the biting of the headboard and how that came to be. And I'll admit, it wasn't as bad as I thought thought it was. Still weird, but not as bad, because it turns out that Verity was biting the headboard while she was sitting on his face, so it's not like she was like getting whoa, 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 and like trying to like hang on to this like headboard with her teeth, but either way, it sounds uncomfortable, and if somebody with veneers tried to do this, their teeth would just fall out, like if it was a scary dream. You know what? I don't know though, because technically I don't know anything about sex, because I watch watch One Piece and I listen to Radiohead, so. Something else important that happens here is that Jeremy reads Verity's first manuscript and he tells her that it's really good and he's like, be ready to be famous. And um, the chapter concludes with Jeremy asking Verity to marry him in the middle of sex. And after she says yes, he finishes inside her without a condom, which it's it happens exactly as I'm saying it. And like, this was completely unconsented and undiscussed and it really disturbs me how Colleen just writes it in here like it's not a big deal. Verity doesn't write about being mad or upset about this at all and she doesn't object to the fact that she may get pregnant from this although she does allude to not being happy after finding out that she got pregnant several months later. For two months, we looked back on the night that we got engaged. For two months, I would grin every time I looked at my ring. But then the night we got engaged became the night we conceived. And here is where it gets real, the guts of my autobiography. This is the point when other authors would paint themselves in a better light rather than throw themselves into an x-ray machine. But there is no light where we're going. This is the final warning, darkness ahead. When Lowen finishes reading this, she goes outside on the patio and further ahead into their huge backyard, she notices that Verity is getting read to by her nurse. Meanwhile, further out, Jeremy and crew are working on tearing apart a dock that's next to this lake that they live by. Their house is huge as fuck, I'm sorry if this is confusing at all, but the lake is like on their property. But when April, the nurse, walks away for a moment, Verity turns her head and looks Lowen right in the eyes. And this scares the crap out of her because she's supposed to be entirely unaware of her surroundings. But she quickly rides this off as nothing because then Verity turns her head again and is obviously just not looking at anything. April then brings Verity back inside and Lowen starts thirsting over Jeremy outside tearing up this- <coughs> Hello? Sorry, that was so rude. Jeremy tearing apart this dock and like his shirt is off. I don't know. It's very heterosexual, muscles out. Oh, the abs are shining and oh, this is so sweaty and oily. And in her monologue, she says that she's finding it hard not to think about sex with him because of the manuscript she's been reading. April then comes up behind her and obviously sees that she's been staring at Jeremy. And she tells her, I'm heading out. I put Verity to bed and turned on her television. She's had dinner and her meds in case he asks. I don't know why she's telling me this since I'm not in charge. Okay, I say, have a good night. She doesn't tell me to have a good night in return. Obviously, the nurse is like, what the hell? I mean, this situation is really weird and it only gets weirder. Jeremy has this 30-year-old attractive writer living with him, seemingly for kind of no reason. Like, there's definitely a way around this. And like, his wife is right up upstairs like anyways once April drives away she heads back into Verity's office and she's just gazing out the window looking at Jeremy all souped up 
up. And she sees crew out there waving at her. So she starts to wave back until she realizes that he's not waving at her. He's looking above her to the right and that's where Verity's room is. And she looks up just in time to see a curtain moving in there. She drops everything and books it upstairs to go investigate. But when she gets there, Verity is just in bed asleep. Her hands are lying peacefully on top of the blanket. It doesn't appear that anything is disturbed at first. Da, da, da. Hey, get out. You're so rude. What do you think about this? She also finds an oscillating fan that's like waving wind back and forth. And every time it moves, it's like shaking the curtain a little bit. So she's like, oh, whew, it's just the fan. But then she notices that there's a remote sitting on top of the dresser and the TV isn't on. When April just said that she left the TV on. So what's really going on here? Lowen is understandably freaked out by Verity. I mean, this is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty spooky. If this were a movie, that would have been another jump scare vine boom. But she tries to shake it off and she returns back to the office and reads another chapter of So Be It. Because hypothetically, reading more of her autobiography should prove that she's harmless. Hypothetically. But this chapter of So Be It is really where it starts getting crazy. It's focused mainly on Verity's pregnancy and how she feels disgusted about the changes of her body and she feels robbed of attention from Jeremy because obviously he's like excited about the baby. Like she feels jealous of this kid before it's even born. And to be so real, I really don't understand why anybody would have a baby just for the sake of their significant other. I'm horrified of pregnancy. I have like a phobia of it. So reading this really gave me body horror vibes. Every time I think about getting pregnant, I think about the scene from Alien where the little alien baby like comes out of the stomach and it really like makes me nauseous. <laughs> but um, she talks about how her breasts are drooping, how her stomach has been stretched thin, bada bada ba. I don't understand. I really don't understand why there was no discussion about having kids at all between them. Do people really just not talk about things like this? Like they just like, Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> but anyways, Verity finds out that she's pregnant with twins. And so she was already thinking like weirdly enough with just the one baby growing inside her, but now she knows that there's two. So her thoughts get more and more deranged. Like, let me just read you page 107 so you could like understand her thought process. Twins, two of them. I had already feared becoming a mother of one baby, being forced to love the one thing Jeremy loved more than me. But when I found out that there were two and that there were girls, I was suddenly not okay with being the third most important thing in Jeremy's life. I tried to force my smile when he'd talk about them. I would act like it filled me with joy when he rubbed my stomach, but it repulsed me, knowing he was only doing it because they were in there. I shuddered daily at the thought of both of them growing inside me, stretching my skin, ruining my breasts. During the fourth month of pregnancy, I started hoping for a miss carriage. I prayed for blood when I went to the bathroom. I imagined how, after losing the twins, Jeremy would make me his priority again. He would dote on me, worship me, care for me, and not because of what was growing inside me. So the irony of this is that they never even talked about abortion in the first place. Like, this whole thing did not have to happen if A, Jeremy wasn't a freak. B, they would have just talked about this and like maybe considered an abortion because obviously she's not fit to be a mother. She gets the ick from him saying that he loves their babies more than anything. And she gets especially mad when she asks him if he loves them more than her and he says yes. Because his and Verity's love is conditional whereas his love for his kids is unconditional. He says he's going to be such a mess when they're born. I'll be a fucking mess mess when they're born and in her inner monologue she's like he's going to cry what the hell and like this was the last straw for her that he said that so she pretends like everything's okay and she excuses herself and goes to the bathroom and she takes a wire hanger and she tries to give herself an abortion and she takes a wire hanger and tries to give herself an abortion and she keeps trying until there's like blood going down her legs and like her stomach is cramping up and the chapter ends like this. I climbed into bed waiting for the miscarriage. My 
arms were shaking, my legs were numb from the squatting, my stomach hurt and I wanted to puke, but I didn't move because I wanted to be in the bed with him when it happened. I wanted to wake him up frantic and show him the blood. I wanted him to panic, to worry and feel bad for me, to cry for me, to cry for me. This is why we should normalize saying that you don't want to be a mom and also just admit that you're crazy. Lowen is shocked and disgusted by what she just read and this makes her start wondering like wait what else is she capable of? What really happened to her two little girls? One of them drowned in the lake in their backyard. Is that sus? This scares her but interestingly enough not enough to keep on reading. We got a plot in here to move along. We can't have you discovering everything all at once, Colleen Hoover said. So she heads downstairs to get a drink and she's looking for anything with alcohol in it when Jeremy comes up behind her and asks her what's wrong. She lies and so she lies and says that one of Verity's books just freaked her out. And this is where we get some pretty important details on the status of Verity. Jeremy tells her that Verity isn't likely to ever recover. And while she isn't paralyzed, she has the mind of an infant now and only has basic reflexes. Crew comes running downstairs to give Jeremy a hug. And Lowen is staring at them when she rationalizes that Verity couldn't have actually hated her twins because then she would have never agreed to have a third child. She's like, maybe writing about her thoughts during pregnancy was like a release for Verity, like a Catholic going to confession. Also very important, Lowen stares at the family portraits that are hanging on the wall and she notices that one of the twins has a small scar on their face, even in her toddler pictures, so it seems like she got the scar very, very early on. Jeremy walks over and joins her and she asks him what their names were. He points to the twin with the scar and says Chastity and the other is named Harper. Lowen asks him how Chastin got her scar and Jeremy says she was born with it. The doctor said it was scarring from fibrous tissue. It's not uncommon, especially with twins because they're cramped for room. But in Lowen's head, she's wondering if she actually got the scar from the attempted abortion. She then asks Jeremy if both girls had an allergy, which she immediately regrets because she's not not supposed to know how his other daughter died, which she had done some googling so she already knew that Chastin was the one who died from anaphylaxis. But he says it's fine and just verifies that it was only Chastin who had a peanut allergy. Jeremy lifts up her hand and there's a scar on her palm and he asks her how she got that scar. But she quickly says, I don't remember. Thank you for dinner. I'm gonna go shower. Throughout the book, Lowen alludes to this like great horrific monstrosity that she committed as a child and mentions that her mom was afraid of her for some reason. I'll read this as an example. Does Jeremy think I wanted a lock on the inside of this bedroom door because I don't feel safe in his house? I hope not because that's not why I wanted the lock at all. I wanted a lock so that they would all be safe from me. Which by the way, sorry, I didn't mention this. There isn't a lock on her door at all so she asked him if he could put one on. Anyways though, I walk to the bathroom and turn on the light. I look down at my hand, trailing my fingers across the scar. After the first few times my mother caught me sleepwalking, she became concerned. My therapist said it was important to unfamiliarize myself with my surroundings. He said it would help if I created obstacles that would be hard for me to move past while I was sleepwalking. A lock on the inside of my bedroom door was one of those obstacles. And and while I'm almost certain I locked it before I fell asleep all those years ago, it doesn't explain why I woke up the next morning with a broken wrist covered in blood. From reading various paragraphs that pretty much reinforce that same thing, you may be expecting something absolutely crazy and bonkers to have happened, right? You're thinking, oh, maybe she attacked her mom or like stood over her mom with a pillow or something very creepy like that that scared the crap out out of her, but the reveal for this is honestly really dull in comparison to the rest of the novel, and you'll see what I mean. This next part of the book is one of the worst detours I've ever read, because there's this tension building inside the house, you know, it 
feels isolated. We don't know if Verity is actually brain dead. We don't know if she's a murderer. And we also don't know Jeremy very well either. And the seclusion of being there is part of what's, again, is part of what's building that spookiness. They pause all of that to go on a target run. Yeah, seriously, Lowen and Jeremy go on a quirky, silly, goofy target run. Lowen is getting tampons while Jeremy is in the grocery section. And when she returns, he's being surrounded, cornered by two attractive women and his back is against the freezer. And they're almost like heckling him. Lowen awkwardly comes up to them and puts her tampons in the cart. And the two women are immediately suspicious of who she is. They say that they're friends of Verity's and the conversation after that goes as follows. Speaking of, Verity must be feeling better if she's got a friend in town. She looks at Jeremy for more explanation. Or is Laura your friend? Laura is here from New York. She's working with Verity. Patricia smiles at the same time she makes a mmm sound and looks back at me. How does one work with a writer exactly? I assumed it would be more of a solitary job. That's usually what non-literary people assume, Jeremy says. He nods at them, dismissing us from the conversation. Have a good afternoon, ladies. He begins to move the shopping cart, but Patricia places her hand on it. Tell Verity I said hello, and we hope she's recovering well. I'll share the message, Jeremy says, walking past her. Give my best to Sherman. Patricia makes a face. My husband's name is William. Jeremy nods once. Oh, that's right. I get them confused. I hear Patricia scoff off as we walk away. When we make it to the next aisle, I say, um, who is Sherman? The guy she fucks behind her husband's back. I look at him, shocked. He's smiling. Holy shit, I say laughing. When we get to the register, I can't stop smiling. I don't know that I've ever seen that kind of epic burn in person. Yeah, that was such an epic freaking burn. That was such a fat freaking W. I'm sorry, but when I hear the words epic burn, I think about Nyan Cat. I think about open Gundam style. Fucking what does the fox say? Those are words that should only be uttered in 2010. But yeah, as soon as they return from this target trip, it just resumes to seriousness as if that never even happened. The following day, Lowen is in Verity's office when she hears a scream coming from upstairs and it's crew and it's coming from Verity's room. Da, da, da. So she's like, what the hell? And she runs upstairs, psh, bursts through Verity's door and crew is sitting on the floor holding his chin and it's bleeding. There's also a knife sitting next to him, but she reaches over and she assesses his wound and it's only a pretty small cut, but she's still like, what the hell is going on here? And she asks him, did you cut yourself with a knife? Crew is is wide-eyed looking up at me he shakes his head probably trying to hide that he had a knife i'm sure jeremy wouldn't approve of that mommy says i'm not supposed to touch her knife i freeze your mommy says that crew doesn't respond crew i say grabbing a washcloth does your mommy talk to you crew's body is rigid and the only thing that moves is his head when he shakes it jeremy hears this whole commotion and comes running upstairs he asks her what happened of course and she says i think he cut himself he was in verity's bedroom there was a knife on the floor jeremy looks at crew what were you doing with a knife jeremy looks at crew what were you doing with a knife crew shakes his head sniffling as he tries to stop crying. I didn't have a knife. I just fell off the bed. Part of me feels bad, like I'd tattled on the poor kid. I tried to cover for him. He wasn't holding it. I saw it on the floor and assumed that's what happened. I'm still shaken from what Cruz said about Verity and the knife, but I remind myself that everyone talks about Verity in present tense. Jeremy tells her to go look for the knife and she goes upstairs into Verity's room and what do you know? The knife is gone. She's looking around the room for the knife and underneath Verity's bed and when she looks up again, Verity's head has turned towards her and is looking right at her. Lowen is really scared by this because not only is she starting to doubt that Verity can't move, now now she has a knife and she's so scared that she thinks to herself I can't stay in this house for another freaking minute. Jeremy then asks her if she grabbed the knife and she has to admit that she couldn't find it. 
And Jeremy looks really confused by this and says, okay, I'm gonna go upstairs and look for it myself. And it was at this moment that I thought that Verity was gonna start framing Lowen for like hurting crew or just being like suspicious or a liar in general. And I think that would have been the perfect move to take here. I mean, as a dad, Imagine your son is screaming. You go upstairs and a woman you barely know is already there with him. And she says that he did this with a knife, but then you go look and there is no knife. Would that not make you a little suspicious? Lowen then goes upstairs, she takes a Xanax, and then continues to read. This chapter goes over the birth of Chastin and Harper, and she says that she's relieved that she had a C-section. And that seems kind of weird for me that Colleen Hoover even put that in there because it doesn't really make sense for her character that is like very obsessed with her body. So I kind of don't know why she she would just be cool with like having a big scar but I digress when these twins are born she's like fully disgusted with them she feels no emotion for them and when the nurse tries to get her to breastfeed she feels like throwing up because she doesn't want them to ruin her boobs Verity takes this disgust to a whole new level too because she feels extremely annoyed at Jeremy for crying over his happiness Jeremy says did you think you were capable of loving someone so much? I rolled my eyes and thought to myself, I have loved someone this much, Jeremy. You, for four years, thanks for noticing. In the following chapter, Lowen starts looking through a box of Verity's old family photos, and Jeremy walks in on her doing this, but joins her unquestionably. Like, I thought he maybe would have gotten weird or defensive about this, but he's just like, sure, why not? This lady that I don't know is looking through my family photos. Lowen notices that one of the twins, Harper, never smiles in any of the pictures, and she asks Jeremy why that is, and he says that she was diagnosed with Asperger's, so she was never very expressive. We also find out that Crew hasn't mentioned either one of his sisters since their deaths, despite being very close to them. Lowen also asks him how he's doing. How are you? And he confesses, when I got the call about Verity, the only thing that was left in me to feel was anger. Toward who? God? No, Jeremy says, his voice quiet. I was angry at Verity. He he looks back at me and he doesn't even have to say why he was angry with her. He thinks she hit the tree on purpose. In the following chapter, Lowen becomes more and more paranoid because she thinks that she hears footsteps in the hallway at night that are lighter than Jeremy's but heavier than Cruz. And these footsteps are creaking one at a time like sneaky like a little mouse. To be honest, 100% this is enough for me to leave. I'm like, bro, you are getting me an Airbnb. I do not want to be here. <laughs> um, also, Jeremy takes her and Crew out to dinner for another really dumb side quest. Lowen is telling Crew like the dumbest jokes I've ever heard, but they act like they're like hilarious. What's red and shaped like a bucket? Crew shrugs. A blue bucket painted red. Jeremy squeezes his jaw, trying to hold back his laughter. Anyways, when they get back from dinner, they hug each other and it's another moment of weird sexual tension. So Verity goes back up to her room and wants to see if the next chapter includes like a sex scene. So weird. She also suspects that Verity is faking her condition and that she may or may not be dangerous. But she's like, oh, I'm gonna look up a little scene with Jeremy Hogg and I'm gonna freaking jerk off. Like she has time to be jerking off. Are you kidding me? Maybe she should read the Steak and Shake one again. That was really hot. Unfortunately for her, the only thing that she finds in the next chapter of So Be It is more or child neglect. Verity writes about how she would pretend to be attentive before Jeremy would leave to work, but as soon as he closed that front door, she would head over to the baby's room, turn off their baby monitors, and then go back to bed with some earplugs in. She would wake up like an hour before he would get back from work, feed the kids, bathe them, and start dinner and just pretend like she had been taking care of them all day. And the babies would be like super calm when he came home too, because they had obviously been like violent 
silently crying all day long. But Jeremy, not knowing this, was like, oh my gosh, you do such a good job with the babies. She also talks about being pissed that Jeremy wouldn't have sex with her immediately after giving birth. And the reason why he didn't want to is because it wasn't considered safe, according to her doctor, because of her cesarean scar, like the, the stitches could like open up again. So he was refusing to touch her, understandably. Dude, why do you even want that like a chance for your freaking scar to rip open and then God knows what comes out of you? I mean, I don't know if that's how it works, but I've just seen a lot of horror movies and then usually when something gets cut there, there's like stuff coming out, like stuff, stuff. <laughs> But Verity wakes him up in the middle of the night, giving him a BJ, and then basically seduces him into having sex with her, and they proceed to have sex for an hour and a half? You're telling me his mind was so clouded from No Nut November that he just like forgot all about his wife's stomach for an hour and a half? Like the whole hour and a half? The scar ends up being fine, by the way, but honestly, if Colleen Hoover was gonna write something so gross, like all the things that happen in this book, she should have just went full on gore. Like, why hold back? It would have kind of made a lot of sense for her scar to open up from this too, because then that would make it so they couldn't have sex even longer, leading for her to become more and more frustrated and for her to be more susceptible to committing more violent acts. Colleen never actually uses the setups that she builds for herself and I don't understand why. In the next chapter, only two significant things happen. Number one, Lowen helps Jeremy carry a fish tank out of the basement and she notices that there's an old storage box down there and it contains baby monitors. And she's inwardly cringing because she knows those are the same monitors that Verity used to turn off and then ignore her kids. Number two, though, Lowen straddles a pillow as she stares at her headboard that has all those teeth marks on it from Verity. And she's like all horned up from this, from staring at Verity's like teeth marks. Like the idea of this crazy wife kind of like gets her rocks off. It's kind of interesting. Moving on to chapter 13, here's where it gets juicy. Rowan wakes up in Verity's bed and she turns around and Verity is there sleeping with her eyes closed. But obviously she's still freaked out by this and she sees that it's the middle of the night and she realizes that she sleepwalked which turns out to have been an issue for her ever since she was a kid she leaves the room in a panic but jeremy heard her so he comes out and tries to hug her and he's like dude what's wrong but she runs away back to her bedroom he comes to her room and asks her what's wrong again and she just explains that she had sleepwalked and she woke up scared and in her inner monologue we learn that she used to have three locks inside her bedroom door to prevent her from waking up in random locations. And Jeremy's like, it's okay, sleepwalking is harmless. But Lowen says, no, no, Jeremy, it's not. I hold my hand up to my chest, still clutching my wrist. I've woken up outside before. I've turned on stoves and ovens in my sleep. I even... I blow out a breath. I broke my hand in my sleep and didn't even feel it until I woke up the next morning. And Jeremy is still like, you sleepwalk, it's not that big of a deal. And she's like, not that big of a deal? I wish my mother would have felt that way. And this is when we finally get an explanation to that horrible thing she did as a child that she's been alluding to the whole book. Because she woke up one morning when she was 10 with her wrist throbbing and blood all over her blankets. Her feet were dirty like she had been outside and she also realized that the locks on her doors had been opened somehow. She started screaming and her mom came and took her to the hospital. And there were security cameras in front of the house so later on they went to go check the camera and like see how this all happened. And at 3 in the morning it showed Lowen walking out onto the front porch, climbing up a railing, and then just standing there for a full hour, balancing there on the edge before finally jumping off. Her wrist apparently got hurt in that fall, but the footage didn't show her having any kind of reaction to it. She just walked back into the house and apparently went to sleep. After this, her mother sent her away for a two-week psych evaluation, and when she returned, her mother had moved farther down the hall into the spare bedroom, and she had put three locks on the inside of her door. So Lowen says, my own mother was 
was terrified of me. And I'm not trying to say that this wouldn't be traumatic for a kid and that this isn't serious, but I do think this backstory was lackluster because I just, I think it could have been a lot better. If her story had been that she tried to stab her mom or like do some kind of violent attack, try to light the house on fire, something like that, it would have made her fear a lot more solid and it would have contributed to her paranoia a lot more, especially if Verity did try to frame her. But instead, the sleepwalking never gets mentioned again after this point. Shh, gone? dead. Never hear about it again. <laughs> Jeremy adds a lock to the inside of Loen's door the next day at her request. Loen reads another chapter of So Be It and this one contains the gnarliest description of child abuse, or at least one of them. There's quite a few in this book, but Verity wakes up in the middle of the night because she had a dream that Harper was on top of the chest and covering her head with a pillow. And in this dream, she was actually really concerned for Chastin. Like she, like she rushed over to the bed in this dream and pulled Harper off of her. But when she removed the pillow from Chastin's face, her face was blank, like no eyes or anything. Or as Verity describes, like the back of a bald head. <laughs> And the dream ends with her asking Harper, what did you do? When Verity awakens, she actually feels really devastated by this dream and this thought of Chastin dying. So it's then that she comes to the conclusion that she actually does love Chastin. Jeremy hears her crying and rolls over to ask her what's wrong. And Verity doesn't want to answer any questions. So she just silently goes down on him and like starts giving him a BJ. And as she puts it, before I even and open my mouth he was hard like like instead of asking her again what's wrong trying to like help her you're just like yeah bj time but while this is happening, they hear one of the babies crying on the, the baby monitor. And so Jeremy tries to get up and go check on them. But Verity convinces him to let them cry for a second and she'll go take care of it when they're done. So she turns the baby monitor off and continues sucking until you know what. And Verity notes that she actually wants to check on the babies right now because she actually feels like a semblance of love for Chastin. But when she opens the door and discovers that it's Harper crying, she gets really disappointed and quickly is very annoyed. She picks up Chastin and starts cuddling her and ignoring Harper and even thinks to herself, shut the fuck up, I'm trying to bond with my baby. As if Harper is just some random outsider here, just like some random little thing that crawled in. She also begins to try to interpret her dream and at first she thinks it's some sort of like premonition about Chastin dying prematurely and so maybe it was a sign that she needs to start loving her now because she won't have a full lifetime with her. But her mind quickly switches to a different theory and it's that this dream is a warning and that she needs to do something about Harper before it's too late. Like she thinks Harper is truly gonna be the one that kills her and she's thinking to herself, should I like suffocate her right now? And she decides against smothering her with a pillow just because she doesn't know how to make that look like an accident. She decides that it would be easier if she makes it look like she choked on her own vomit in her sleep. And she justifies this by saying that she's saving Chastin by killing Harper. Like Harper was gonna kill her if I didn't do this. So she shoves her fingers down her throat and keeps holding them there until she's no longer crying and her limbs go stiff. The only thing that stops her from straight up killing this kid right now at this moment is Jeremy walking in the room and he's asking if everything is okay so Verity quickly takes her fingers out of her mouth and presses the baby into her chest so he can't hear her like do the initial gasp. I kind of don't understand how she could possibly pull her fingers out of her mouth fast enough for Jeremy to not see it, or at the very least to just look very, very suspicious because Harper suddenly pukes on her and is crying so violently and crazy like they've never heard before and between each cry, she's like gasping for air. Jeremy picks her up to try to soothe her and Verity is just annoyed that he's giving attention to her and not her. Sorry, that sounded weird. She leaves this whole situation and just goes to take a shower and by the time she comes out, Jeremy has already fixed the situation and fed 
fed her and he's back in bed plugging the baby monitor back in, which causes Verity to panic because she realizes that if the baby monitor had been plugged back in, then he would have seen what she was doing. So literally the only reason why she didn't get caught is because that baby monitor just happened to be unplugged. When Lowen finishes reading this chapter, she feels insanely disturbed and her stomach is cramping. She's like, oh God, what the hell, oh God. And like, understandably. But as soon as she's describing how sick she feels, how horrible that was, Jeremy comes in and announces that he's made her margaritas and tacos. And then she just completely forgets about this for the rest of the chapter. No, I'm not even kidding. How are you gonna let tacos and margaritas distract you from attempted murder? How? The two of them have a romantic evening outside. How cute is that? Jeremy says that he never read any of Verity's books after the first one because he had a hard time dealing with the fact that what she wrote came out of her imagination when it's so disturbing. And that that kind of drove her crazy because she really wanted his validation like bad. And Lowen says that she doesn't really get that much validation because no one's ever actually come up to her and told her how much they like her books. Her and Jeremy Jeremy stare at each other for a long time again and it seems like they're about to kiss but then he says it's late I better lock you in your room. So he takes her to her room and before he locks her in there, he says, Verity never read your book. I'm the one who read your book and it was good, phenomenal, which is why I suggested your name to her editor. Your writing matters to me, Lowen. And then he locks her door and walks away and she does like that stereotypical thing like that you see in movies that teenagers do where they close the door and then they like slide down it. And then as Lowen puts it, I cozy up in the bed with the chapter I brought with me. Jeremy made me feel so good right now. I don't even mind being a little disturbed by his wife before I fall asleep. A little disturbed? A little? So you're just like big chillin' right now. I cozy up in bed with another chapter. Like what the hell? Those margaritas must have been strong. So this chapter of So Be It comprised of Verity revealing the true story behind how Rue ended up being conceived. It all starts when Jeremy gets mad at Verity for only ever talking about Shastin and never Harper. And he's like pissed. He like throws a filet mignon at the wall and Verity kind has no choice but to say oh that's not true you know like I treat them differently because one of them likes the attention and the other one doesn't and plus their teacher from daycare told me that Harper might have Asperger's so I'm just doing what's right and Jeremy believes her and is like oh my god I'm so sorry I didn't know that the daycare teacher told you that so Jeremy apologizes to her and is like oh my god I'm so sorry I didn't know that the daycare teacher said that and at this point, Verity had already proved that she does quote unquote care about Harper like Jeremy already believed it. So I don't know why she felt the need to add on this next part, but she tells him it's going to be really expensive putting three kids through daycare. And Jeremy's like, what? three kids? And Verity lies and says that she's pregnant just to like throw off the scent of her trail. Like of course I'm a good mother otherwise I wouldn't want to have another kid. I mean that's very like that's logical. And Verity's like okay I have like two weeks to try to get pregnant and if not then I'm just gonna fake a miscarriage. All of this is wild as shit of course but that doesn't stop Lowen from saying one of the funniest things in the start of the next chapter. Lowen says it's it's been another week of reading Verity's manuscript, and I'm bored. I'm finding it repetitive. Chapter after chapter of detailed sex with Jeremy. Very little to do with her children. I'm bored. Can you do something a little more interesting, like when you tried to murder your kid? That was really cool. That was interesting. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're bored. Okay, first of all, take your little ass fucking downstairs and go tell somebody what's happening. <laughs> Lowen goes downstairs and watches TV with Jeremy, during which she reveals that tomorrow is her birthday. So he makes her a cake and then that stereotypical thing happens where she has cake on her lip and then he wipes it off for her, you know. I don't know what this trope is called, but there's always something gross on somebody's lip and then the guy is like, ooh, let me help you out with that. And they start making out and in her mind, she's like, we both taste like chocolate. And like, I just want somebody in one of these 
these books to admit just once every now and again when you're not prepared for a kiss your breath just smells like donkey freaking dick have you ever eaten chocolate and then just not brush your teeth for several hours because i'm telling you it smells weird it's weird it's hot like y you're saying you just your breath just tastes amazing after eating chocolate uh, i don't believe you but anyways they move this makeout sesh onto the couch and he takes off her shirt and like he has her titty in his mouth when she's looking up and she sees Verity at the top of the stairs. And so Lowen's like, holy shit, but their interaction goes as follows. Verity's fists clench at her sides before she rushes back in the direction of her room. I gasp, shoving him, pushing him. Verity, I say breathless. He stops kissing me and then lifts his head but doesn't move. Verity, I say again, wanting him to understand that he needs to get the fuck off me. He lifts onto his arms, confused. Verity, I say again, but with more urgency. It's all I can say. Like, she really had to say Verity three times for you to get your ass up. She tells Jeremy that she saw Verity at the top of the stairs, and Jeremy's just like, she can't walk. Like, that's impossible. But Lowen's like yelling, like, I know what I saw. Like, I know I saw her. And so he actually goes upstairs to go check. But by the time he gets to her room, of course, she's already in bed, faking being asleep. He takes Lowen back to her room and chalks this whole thing up to them not getting enough sleep and also feeling guilty because obviously he's still married. And she gets straight to the point with no subtlety whatsoever. She says, Jeremy, could she be faking her injuries? He doesn't answer right away, almost as if he has to give the question some thought. No, he finally says, I saw the scans, but people get better. Injuries heal. I know, he says, but Verity couldn't fake something like this. No one could. It would be impossible. This is kind of interesting because he doesn't know that she's faking being sick so I feel like if somebody tried to bring this up to me I would be kind of pissed off by it but he's not at all he's just like eh, no she couldn't she couldn't be faking it come on I don't like him for several reasons but it's annoying how he has literally like no boundaries when it comes to people in his life like oh look through my family pictures ask me if my wife's faking her injuries my son's mom but Lowen still feels paranoid and she decides that the only way she's gonna get more answers is if she continues reading the manuscript which by the way if this had been me or like practically anybody else I think you would want to like just finish the manuscript as soon as the attempted murder came up like that's not really something you can just like sit on and drink margaritas to after <laughs> this chapter of the manuscript talks about Verity letting a nanny take care of crew as he was a baby and then any work that that nanny Annie didn't do would go to Jeremy so she practically wasn't spending any time with him at all and she would even lie and say that she was needed for some kind of like book conference out in New York but then just not go and like hole up in an Airbnb and watch TV for a week just so that when she came back she could get a lot of attention more importantly though this goes over her reaction to Chastin's death and of course it's sad that Chastin died but the way that that Verity describes it in the book comes off as like it's it's like morbidly funny I don't know how else to explain it she says I think about the moment that we were told we lost Chastin the phone rang I was washing the chicken Jeremy answered it I was washing the chicken he raised his voice still washing the fucking chicken <laughs> like I don't know if I'm just broken I don't know if I'm just broken or washing the fucking chicken is actually just like a funny sentence because this kind of sent me. But Verity describes being actually devastated by this event and unfortunately the entire time that they were driving to the hospital to see her and identify her, she was already conspiring about how Harper did it. Now that Chastin has actually died, she's turning against Harper more than ever and just to be straightforward, 
forward, Justin died because she was at a sleepover with friends, and although the parents knew that she had a peanut allergy and they had hidden any food that contained any peanuts, the girls had snuck into the kitchen in the middle of the night and taken more snacks, some of which they didn't realize had peanuts. She was also only eight, and obviously it was like dark, they're hanging out, watching movies, whatever, so she wasn't really paying attention to this. And then when they all woke up, they just noticed that she was unresponsive. There's literally nothing sus about it. It's just tragic. It's just a tragedy. So Verity connecting the dots to her somehow is like a new level of bonkers central. She even fantasizes about how things could have ended differently if only her murder attempt when she was a baby would have worked. The following day, Lowen sees Verity sitting in front of a TV in the living room and she decides to test her reflexes by throwing a wooden ball next to her chair to see if she'll even flinch but of course she doesn't move at all but when she returns to the kitchen to prepare dinner she notices that the TV is no longer making sound. She calls to Jeremy to see if it was him but when she calls him she hears his voice coming from upstairs meaning it couldn't have been him that muted it only Verity. So Lowen stomps over there and she's like, you're a fucking, I don't know if I could say this without getting demonetized on YouTube, but C-U-N-T. And she says, you don't even deserve the body you're trapped in, I whisper, staring straight into her eyes. I hope you die with your throat full of your own vomit the same way you attempted to kill your infant daughter. I wait. If she's in there, if she heard me, if she's faking it, my words would reach her. They would make her flinch or lash out or something. She doesn't move. I try Try to think of something else to say that might make her react. Something she wouldn't be able to keep her composure after hearing. I stand up and lean into her. I bring my mouth to her ear. Jeremy is gonna fuck me in your bed tonight. I wait again for a noise, for a movement. The only thing I notice is the smell of urine. So I guess the pee was the response. Jeremy sees this and takes her upstairs to wash her and change her because when the nurse isn't here, he's the one who does those things. Which by the way, that is truly commitment to the bit. Like to have somebody wiping your pee and poo for the fuck of it all? It's commitment for sure. Later on, Lowen tries to convince Jeremy to put Verity in a home, basically like a care center that would just take care of her so that he doesn't have to feel like he can't leave this house and he could go out and find somewhere else to live with Crew. And he's hesitant about this because he doesn't want to take Crew away from his mom, even though she's unresponsive. But Lowen's like, wait, like what do you want to do though? Like not for Crew, for Verity, for anyone. What do you want? And he's like, I want you. So they start making out and they go upstairs to have sex, which by the way, here's a recurring theme in the Whovian metaverse. The girls always describe sex as painful at first. And I'm assuming this is the polite version of Colleen Hoover saying they have big fat hogs. <laughs> She does it every time though. Like there's not an ounce of creativity. I seriously feel like somebody on Wattpad could think of a better way to say that. Or at the very least, use a different one for each book, please. But anyways, this is when something weird happens. Big surprise, something weird is happening in a Colleen Hoover book. This moment feels like borderline like cucking behavior because Lowen is riding Jeremy's face and she's staring at these indentations on the headboard from Verity's teeth. And she's like, you know what? I'm gonna do this too. And she like starts biting on it and she tries to bite harder than Verity's marks and like feels the indentations under her. And it feels like this is so weird. <laughs> but they fall asleep and when they wake up, Jeremy starts freaking out because he wasn't supposed to fall asleep in there. He wanted to check on crew before he went to bed. And so he goes over to the door to open it and psh, it can't open. It's not opening. What's going on? And they figure out that Lowen's door is locked from the outside. And Lowen says, I know you think it isn't plausible, but did you lock Verity's door last night? If by some bizarre chance it was Verity who locked us in here, Crew probably isn't here anymore. He actually looks really scared when she says this, so he grabs a t-shirt, wraps it around his fist, punches the window, and then is able to get out that way. Once he gets back in the house, he goes to Verity's room and sees Crew and her in there completely normal, just asleep. Lowen decides 
decides that she's finally going to read the last chapter of So Be It, which takes place six months after the day that Chastin passed away. And of course, Verity is being delusional about Harper again. She keeps observing her and like taking notes about how she's never seen her cry since she passed. So obviously she must be the murderer if she's not crying in front of me. So she confronts her freaking eight-year-old daughter and says, are you even upset that Chastin is dead? Harper lifted up her eyes to meet my gaze. She was pretending to be afraid of me. You haven't even cried. Not once. Your twin sister died and you act like you don't even care. I do care, Harper said. I miss her. I laughed at her. My daughter brought on the actual tears. She scooted her chair back and ran up to her bedroom. I looked at Crew and flicked a hand in Harper's direction. Now she cries. Figures. Jeremy catches Harper crying as she runs up the stairs and asks Verity what happened to her. And so she lies and just says, oh, she wanted to play out on the lake and I told her no. And he tells her that she should bring them out to the lake because she hasn't been spending any time with them at all since Chastin died, and he figures that it's because she's depressed, but really it's just because she doesn't want to spend time with anyone. And so Jeremy leaves to go grocery shopping. Meanwhile, Verity takes Crew and Harper out onto the lake in a canoe. And as they get in, Verity is already plotting on how she can kill Harper and like make it look like an accident somehow. And the kids have been out on this lake many times in the canoe, but Harper does not know how to swim. So when she gets in the front of the canoe, she decides that she's going to tip it over and then just not help her get back to the shore. And so Crew is right in front of her in the middle of the canoe, and she says this to him verbatim right before she tips it over. Crew, sweetie, hold your breath. The boat flips and she grabs Crew and just swims him over to the shoreline, leaving Harper there all alone while she's obviously drowning. And Crew is screaming, he's like, Mommy, please go get her, she can't swim. And the only reason why she actually does go get back inside the lake is because she thinks it will look suspicious if she doesn't. So she tells Crew to go back inside the house and call Daddy and she'll go look out there for her. And she gets in the lake, pretends to be in a hysteric mess so that when Jeremy arrives and he jumps into the lake and also is trying to look for her, he has no reason to suspect her yet. When he finally finds her, she's been under for over a half an hour, so it's obvious that she's dead and she had gotten caught in like a fishing net, so I guess that's the reason why she didn't like struggle for longer. So then Jeremy brings her to the shore where paramedics keep trying to take her from him, but he just keeps holding her. And honestly, this part is pretty sad he just keeps saying, I love you, Harper. I love you, Harper, over and over again as he holds her dead body, which really drives the point home just how cruel Verity really is. Verity keeps trying to tell him that she tried to save her. I tried to save her. But he doesn't reply and he leaves with Harper in an ambulance. And as it's driving away, she's getting mad because he's not giving her attention. At this point, Lowen can't even finish reading the chapter because she feels sick, she feels like throwing up, and she starts debating whether or not she should tell anybody about this. It's too much for her to handle, so she takes a Xanax and goes to bed. A few hours later, she's awakened by Jeremy, and she asks him how he got in her room because, of course, it was locked. And he says that he just came in through the window that he broke earlier. And when I read this, I was like, oh my god, Verity is gonna come through that broken window at some point and try to get her. But unfortunately, this never comes up again. And it just pissed me off so much because that was just such a perfect setup for something creepy to happen with Verity. It was so perfect. Like, why did you not take your own bait? But anyways, he tells her that he's actually gonna take her up on her advice about putting Verity in a nursing home. So he signed her up for one and she's only going to be visiting the house three weekends a month. And it's because of this that Loen decides not to say anything to him about the manuscript. She says, if she really is faking her injuries, he'll find out. And if he does find out, he'll never allow her around crew again. And I'm trying to understand why this is her line of thinking because this is fucking dumb as rocks. You know, this woman is a murderer and could potentially hurt crew and also may have already because did you forget about the knife incident where he just magically had a knife and cut himself, quote unquote? 
after this lovely sexy conversation about putting his wife in a nursing home, they end up having sex again, and this time, Jeremy makes no attempt at pulling out of her, meaning that this non-consensual thing is happening again with somebody else, like this isn't even a one-time thing, like he just does this. Like Lowen even said that she's not on birth control. I don't know and understand why Colleen Hoover just puts in like, here's a little stealth thing, here's a little stealth thing, and then doesn't have any of the characters react appropriately to said stealth thing. Holy fuck. Jeremy is so fucking dumb, I'll kill him with a gun. Lowen goes back to sleep and she has a dream about Crew, where she describes looking into his eyes and seeing nothing but evil, which is again another perfect setup. This could have easily been the setup for the plot twist. Like what if Lowen ended up getting so paranoid from everything that's going on that she ended up conspiring to hurt Crew in the same way that Verity was conspiring about Harper from her dream. Like why did this even happen? Why is this written down if it was not going to contribute to anything? And in the next chapter, Lowen is still deciding whether or not she should tell anybody about this homicidal woman in here. And she says, It's been several hours since then, and I can't help but wonder if keeping silent about the manuscript is in Crew's best interest. He saw his sister drown. He saw his mother do very little to help her. And while he is very young, there's a possibility that memory will stay with him, that he'll always know she told him to hold his breath before she tipped the canoe over on purpose. Yeah, um, you do actually have a moral obligation to to at least attempt to tell Jeremy about this or anybody, somebody. Like you're really not gonna take any steps to protect this poor little traumatized child. She goes downstairs and Crew is in the kitchen so she helps him make some peanut butter and jelly on Ritz crackers, which by the way, so bomb, haven't done that in a long time. Once you get to a certain age, you just don't put peanut butter on crackers anymore and that's really sad. But he's licking the peanut butter off of a butter knife when Lowen decides to ask him about the canoe incident to verify some information. Can I ask you a question? He gives me one exaggerated nod. Yup, I smile, wanting him to feel comfortable with my line of questioning. Did you guys used to have a canoe? He pauses in the middle of licking the butter knife again, then says, yes. I scan his face for clues that I should stop, but he's not giving me any. Did you ever play in it out on the water? Do you remember being in the canoe with your mother and Harper? Crew doesn't nod or say yes. He stares at me and I can't tell if he's scared to answer the question or if he just doesn't remember. Crew, I say. Why did the boat tip over? Crew's eyes flick back to mine and he pulls the knife out of his mouth for a moment, long enough to say, Mommy said I shouldn't talk to you if you ask me any questions about her. <laughs> These are moments in the book that I actually really enjoy. Like, I love the spookiness. This is peak Blumhouse movie right here. She then asks him, Crew, does your mommy pretend she can't talk? And in response to that, he clenches his teeth down on this butter knife. It goes in between his teeth and starts cutting into his gums and there's just like blood going down this kid's chin. Lowen snatches the knife away from him and starts calling for Jeremy for help. And again, by the way, this would be a perfect situation to frame Lowen. This kid keeps getting hurt when she's around. Is that not suspicious? <laughs> Jeremy takes a look at Crew and assesses his injuries and decides that he needs to take him to the hospital hospital. And he's like, stay here with Verity. I can't leave Verity alone. And I'm like, wait, what? Didn't you guys just go out to dinner a couple chapters ago at night when April, the nurse, clearly wouldn't have been there? But whatever, he just leaves her in the house alone with Verity. <laughs> and here's a moment where I was expecting to get a big showdown between Verity and Lowen since they're being forced to be in the same house together. But um, Lowen just concocts a plan to go down to the basement and get those baby monitors that she saw in there earlier. And she takes one upstairs to Verity's room, places is one on one of her drawers and then quickly runs out of there and is like, okay, I'm going to watch this monitor until she does something. Over an hour and a half goes by and Verity still hasn't moved, so she decides to finally read the very ending of this manuscript and get it over with. And the end of this thing details Jeremy's skepticism about what really happened with the canoe. He keeps asking her questions like, 
Why did you take them in the canoe? Why weren't they in their life jackets? What was the last thing she said? Was she still above the water when you made it to the shore with crew? And Verity tries to come up with like quick answers for all of these, but he's still not buying it. And he says, it just doesn't make sense. And he hits her with a crazy one-two knockout punch Mayweather question and says, Why did you tell Crew to hold his breath, Verity? Woo! And in Verity's inner monologue, she says, That's the moment I knew it was over. That's the moment he knew it was over. I knew no matter how hard I tried to convince him, he would never believe me over Crew. I said that as we were tipping, not before. He watched me for a moment, then he released me, pulled away from me for what I knew would be the very last time. I tried to lie still with no reaction so he'd think I fell asleep, but all I did was cry gently. When I got to my office, I opened the manuscript and began to type. Am I at the end of my story? I don't know what happens next. Unlike my prediction of Chastin's murder, I don't know how my life will end. Will it be at the hands of Jeremy? Or will it be by my own hand? Maybe he'll wake up convinced that Harper's death was not an accident. Maybe he'll want me to suffer for what I did to her. And if that's the case, so be it. I'll just drive my car into a tree. The end. That's the end of the manuscript. So I really liked this tension-filled moment. The only thing maybe Maybe I didn't like about it was that I felt like the last line was a little goofy. So be it. I'll just drive into a tree. <laughs> Lowing gasps when she reads this because this means that Jeremy suspected her of murdering Harper this whole time. But he still takes care of Verity, which is weird. He comes home with crew and announces that he needed six stitches for his knife incident. And as soon as he goes upstairs, that's when Lowen notices that Verity on the baby monitor she can see see her on her hands and knees doing something. She screams for Jeremy to come back down, but she literally should have just screen recorded that shit or something because this was a major fuck up. Verity heard her screaming and of course runs to get back into bed and act natural. Lowen runs upstairs with a kitchen knife and threatens Verity and is like, get up bitch, get the fuck up, what's going on here? And she's literally yelling, she's grabbing Verity's legs, like pulling her out of the bed. And Jeremy hears all this go down and so he enters the room and is like, stop, stop. She tries to convince him that she's faking it and that she saw it on the baby monitor, but he doesn't believe her and tells her to get out of his house. So she runs upstairs, grabs Verity's manuscript and shoves it at Jeremy and is like, please read this at least the last couple pages because you deserve to know the truth. And so he takes the manuscript to his room and he hasn't been there very long when Lowen starts hearing him crying and his footsteps stomping towards towards Verity's room. So she follows him and in my opinion, the next thing that happens happens way too insanely fast. So I'm just gonna read some of it to you because it's like, this truly feels like Colleen Hoover's deadline was coming up because this, this just feels rushed. So he's stepping towards Verity in her room and he says, Verity, if you don't answer me, I'm calling the police. She still doesn't answer him. He walks over to her, reaches down, and pulls one of her eyelids open. He stares at her for a moment, then walks towards the door. But when he pauses, like he's questioning himself, he turns around and walks over to her. When I walk out of this room, I'm taking your manuscript straight to the police. They'll put you away and you'll never see me or crew again. If you don't open your eyes and tell me what's going on in this house. Several seconds pass. I'm holding my breath, waiting for her to move, hoping she moves so that Jeremy will know I'm telling the truth. A whimper escapes my throat when she opens her eyes. I slap my hand over my mouth before it turns into a scream. I'm afraid I'll wake Crew, and this is not something he needs to walk into. She holds up her hands. Please don't hurt me. I'll explain everything. Don't hurt you? Jeremy spins around, taking a step forward. You killed her, Verity. I can hear the anger in his voice. She tries to jump off the bed to escape him, but he doesn't allow it. He grabs her by the leg and yanks her back onto the bed. When she starts to scream, he covers her mouth. They struggle. She's trying to kick him. He's trying to hold her down. Then his other hand forms a circle around her throat. She's trying to fight back, but he overpowers her in every way. Jeremy! I rush to him and try to pull him off of her. You're crushing her windpipe. They'll know you killed her. Tears are forming down his cheeks. She killed our daughter, Lo. Think about crew, I say. Your son will not have a father if you do this. There's a plea in his eyes, but it's not a plea for me to call for help. It's a plea for me to help him figure out a better 
better way to end her. You have to make this look like an accident, I say. Make her vomit, cover her nose and mouth until she stops breathing. It'll look like she aspirated in her sleep. I hear the gagging and then the choking, and it feels like it goes on forever. After a while, the sound of three people's lungs turns into two. It's only me and Jeremy breathing right now. Okay, hear me out. I think this book would have been a lot better if they had kept her alive, but like locked her in the basement or something and then had like this psychological like face off with her. Like they could have kept her for questioning and like barely fed her and then it would have led to these like ethical questions of like, even if she did do it, is what you guys are doing to her okay? Like that one Breaking Bad episode, sorry if you don't know what I'm talking about. Because Verity is a very manipulative, smart person, at least from what we know. So it would have been interesting to see that back and forth between them. And then maybe it would have escalated to this ending but it just going straight to this it's i don't think it's good anyways jeremy keeps repeating verity died in her sleep verity died in her sleep and we're never going to talk about this ever again and then the two of them decide that they're going to call the ambulance in the morning and deal with it then and while they did try to make this look like an accident with the vomit it still seems extremely sus because there was a lock placed on the front of her door and not to mention that he was like living with this younger woman in the house while he's still married to her and then all of a sudden she dies like that when she's been perfectly fine this whole entire time. And even like the nurse, the nurse like witnessed kind of like suspicious things about their relationship, like they might have been having an affair. So it's just kind of like, there's like kind of eyewitness testimony here. Even the fucking lady they met at Target, like at Target they were like suspicious that they were having an affair. That's like a thousand percent a motive because he probably gets the money that is Verity's when she dies. Especially since in the following chapter, we cut to seven months later and Lowen says she only left to Manhattan for two weeks before he came to her and started living with her. Oh yeah, and she's pregnant. Typical Colleen Hoover ending, holy crap. Will we ever get an ending for a female protagonist that doesn't end with her being barefoot and pregnant? Just gotta reiterate that she barely knows this guy again and she saw him kill someone in front of her? If that's not relationship damaging, I don't know what is. But they decided to sell Verity's old house and to move to North Carolina once they figured out that she was pregnant. And so here we are in the epilogue when they're heading back to that house just to collect their remaining things, pack them up and just start over in this new house. And everything seems normal. Jeremy's carrying all these things, loading them up. When Crew walks over to Lowen and says, I almost forgot, he says, rushing towards the stairs. I have to get my stuff out of mom's floor. I watch as he runs upstairs towards Verity's old bedroom. It was empty last time I checked. But a moment later, Crew comes walking downstairs with papers in his hand. What are those? I ask him. Pictures I drew for my mom. He shoves them in my hands. I forgot she used to keep them in the floor. Hi! Hi baby. Hello. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. I just, okay. I haven't seen you and I wanted to say hi to you. Hello. I love you. I miss you. I miss you too. Mm. I just got off work so. You did? Yeah. That's awesome. Love you. I love you too. I just fell. And that's when Lowen remembers that the night she saw her on the baby monitor when she was on her hands and knees, she looked like she was digging for something on the floor. I rush upstairs and even though I know she's dead and isn't in there, I'm still terrified as I walk down the hallway to her room. My eyes fall to the floor, to a piece of wood crew, to a piece of wood crew failed to put back in place after he took out his pictures. I kneel down and pick up the loose piece of flooring. It's dark so I reach my hand inside and feel around. I pull out something small, a picture of the girls. I reach in again and feel around and find an envelope. I open it and pull out a letter. It's a handwritten letter to Jeremy. Fearfully, I begin to read. And what follows this is a 13 page letter where Verity basically says that the entire manuscript was fake. And the only reason that she wrote any of that down was for a writing exercise. Something her editor suggested called antagonistic journaling, which is basically where you write down different things that happened in your life but write your point of view as the opposite of what you actually felt which when I read this I was like okay my first question if this is true why did you not tell him about this like why was your communication on like level zero like I would make sure to tell somebody this 
just in case like i'm paranoid she goes on to say i don't regret writing it because my only intention was to eventually help other writers but i do regret writing about harper's death just days after it happened my mind was in such a dark space though and sometimes as a writer the only way to clear your mind is to let the darkness spill out onto a keyboard it was my therapy no matter how hard that may be for you to understand besides i never thought you would read it beyond that first manuscript you never read anything i wrote so why did you choose to read that one she also says yes i did tell crew to hold his breath i told him to hold his breath as the canoe was tipping over i was trying to help him i thought harper would be fine because we played i thought harper would be fine because we played in that lake many times so my focus was on crew after he fell out of the water not even 30 seconds had passed before i realized harper wasn't right behind us and to to be honest, I find this really, really hard to believe too, because how would she have time as the canoe was tipping over to say, crew, sweetie, hold your breath? Because that verbatim is what was said. But there's also kind of a funny attitude from Verity going on in this letter because she's like, I can't explain the mind of a writer to you, Jeremy, especially the mind of a writer who has been through more devastation than most writers combined. We're able to separate our reality from fiction in such a way that it feels like if we live in both worlds but never both worlds at once i can't explain the mind of a writer to you jeremy <laughs> But this next part is really what sent me flying into the air and into outer space because it's truly fucking wild. In a nutshell, it says that the day after Jeremy was finding her suspicious, she woke up and he was reading the manuscript. She, she tried to explain to him that it wasn't real, but he literally gave her no time to explain at all. He just lunged on her and started strangling her. Like, literally, she was like, no, wait, it's not true. And he just like, bleh, 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 like fucking idiot <laughs> whether or not this is true what she's saying idiot move seriously you're just not gonna let anybody explain you're just gonna like leap right into homicide but here's verity's take on the car crash that happened she says i'm not sure what the sequence of events was after that i know i passed out maybe you panicked because you realized you had almost killed me if i had died on that bed you would have been arrested for my murder crew wouldn't have a father i woke up in the passenger seat of my range rover and you were behind the wheel there was tape on my mouth and my hands and feet were bound together again i just wanted to explain to you that what you read wasn't true i looked down and realized i didn't have a seatbelt on and it was in that moment i realized what you were doing you were going to kill me and make my death look like an accident i had unknowingly written my own death in those last two sentences of my manuscript i'm assuming you removed the tape from my hands and feet placed me into the driver's side of the vehicle and walked home where you waited for the police to come notify you that i had died this is so ridiculous that it crosses over to camp for me and so i have to say that i did genuinely enjoy this letter it's so fucking stupid like what do you mean you were bound and taped and put in the passenger seat and he just crashed the car and he wasn't hurt at all like he just wasn't hurt and there wasn't any evidence that you hit the dashboard and you probably hit the I can't think of the word right now but the the front window of a car like it's just too much that doesn't make sense anyway so she says that she was in a coma for several days but when she woke up she saw Jeremy standing next to her and he still looked pissed off at her like he wanted to kill her so she pretended to be not all there and so she kept faking her brain injuries while she was trying to decide what she should do from then on. But again, this doesn't make any sense because earlier Jeremy said that she had brain scans taken and like as if the hospital wouldn't continue taking scans of her brain to figure out what's going on with her. Like, why did they just assume that she's just not all there? Like they didn't take any follow up tests. And I understand that if she woke up, she was thinking, oh, Jeremy's just going to give the manuscript to the police and then I'm I'm gonna go to jail but like how is pretending 24 hours a day that you can't do anything having somebody wipe your butt for you not being able to do what you want better than jail like why not just go to jail like at least there you could like do some things like you could do pull-ups you could read books here you can't do anything at all you can't even talk to anyone but again that's just commitment to the bit i guess but the letter concludes like this. I'm leaving you this note. 
Maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. I hope you do, I really hope you do. Because even after you tried to choke me to death and crash my car into a tree, I can't find it in myself to hate you. You have always been fierce in your protection of our children, which is exactly how parents should be. You're telling me you don't resent this guy at all? Like, he gave you no chance to explain yourself, again, if this is even true. And I mean, her plan to get out of here when her money for her series come in is also kind of dumb because like that money is going to be going to Lowen's account. Like how exactly do you plan on getting that money? But her last stage of the plan is to take her money, take crew and get out of here. I don't blame you for what you've done to me. You're a wonderful husband until you couldn't be. I love you even still, Verity. Lowen is confused and shocked by what she just read because for one, if Jeremy had already read the manuscript, he made no indication of that at all, but she makes the decision to go to the bathroom and shred this letter up, flush pieces of it down the toilet, eat some of the pieces so that n no one can ever find out about this. Not even him. And she says she does this because she thinks if Jeremy found out that he killed his innocent wife that he wouldn't be able to live with himself. So the book finally ends with this. I have no idea what to believe, so why put him through more anguish? Verity could have written that letter as a way to try and cover her tracks. It could have been another ploy at manipulating the situation and everyone involved. I can't blame him. He believed Verity maliciously murdered his child. I can't even blame him for ultimately following through with her murder when he found out she had been deceiving him about her injuries. Any parent in his position would have did the same. Should have done the same. No matter which way you look at it, it's clear that Verity was a master at manipulating the truth. The only question that remains is which truth was she manipulating? Girl, that doesn't scare you? How does that not scare you? What if something happens between the two of you and he just doesn't ask any questions and doesn't listen to you at all and just kills you like he did her? Just leaping to strangling and staging a murder? Like that's not normal behavior and no, not every parent would do that. <laughs> it would make more sense to me if this ended on a ominous note for Lowen. Instead of her just being fully with it and supportive of this, I think it would have been more effective for her to be terrified and that would have been a more spooky impactful ending the man she's having a baby with a murdered somebody actually and b might have tried to stage a murder also he lied to her about the manuscript so there's so many better ways that we could have ended up here so it's really a shame it's really a shame because there are high points of this book but the low points are very low <laughs> interestingly enough though there is a bonus chapter that Colleen Hoover added later on and I'll link it in the description in case you want to read it for yourself but to summarize it basically Lowen ends up being very insecure after she has her baby and keeps comparing herself to Verity like the way that she was written in that manuscript and then the craziest thing that happens is them taking the kids to the beach and then I guess the beach is just like super empty not even one person or a lifeguard and Jeremy sees that remember that girl from the Target run that he made fun of way earlier in the book he runs into her and decides immediately that he should just kill her because she's probably suspicious about their affair and he just drowns her in the ocean like just just boom drowning her in the ocean and again Lowen is just like okay with this like oh okay, he had to do it he had to do it like no he fucking didn't and then literally less than an hour later when they get home she's like sucking him off and it's like what is what the fuck is one character in this book fucking normal i think the added ending made it so much worse for me because at least with the og ending there was more like ambiguity and i kind of liked that you know despite being dissatisfied in general like i think the og verity i would give an anthony fantano light four out of ten and then the and then the bonus ending version of Verity, I would give a light two out of ten. And I'm being very generous, okay? The the light four is very generous because there's so there's just so many ways that this could have been better. But anyways, thank you so much, so much for watching. And thank you so much to my patrons. You guys mean the world to me. And I will see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.